All right, we are live on YouTube and live on Zoom. All right, and I see some attendees starting to pop in here. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the um, Lurie College of Education Summer 2021 K-12 Teaching Academy. Um, as you come in and um, get settled, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Um, please do make sure that you are um, directing it towards all panelists and attendees and not just all panelists. That's a, a little tip I learned this morning, so. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Thank you for getting us started, Marissa. We're glad to have you here. Excellent. And welcome back, Armin. And Lisa. Excellent. Welcome, Maria. That's a familiar name I see that we will hear from tomorrow as well. Excellent. Welcome. I see Oak Grove and Los Altos, some local to San Jose. Excellent. So if you're just joining us, welcome to the K-12 Teaching Academy. We are so excited to have you here. Um, we will begin soon, but please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat um, and make sure it's directed to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see. Excellent. We have some San Jose State faculty, excellent. And Kate, you'll have to tell me if Ukiah, what or what part of California, Ukiah, if I'm saying that correctly, I hope so, is in. Excellent. Welcome, Cynthia from New Jersey. That's awesome. Ah, okay. Excellent. So Mendocino, I, I know that region. Excellent. <laughs> Right, we'll give everyone a couple of minutes to come on in and get settled and then we will go ahead and get started with a couple um, of announcements today. We are so excited that you are here to join us for the Lurie College of Education K-12 Teaching Academy. Excellent, yes, welcome to those studying to become our future educators. It's exciting to see you here. Excellent. Welcome, welcome. Hello and welcome. It's nice to see we have really a, a nice, you know, spectrum of all different grade levels here today. This is exciting to see.
Right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for introducing yourself in the chat. I love that I see schools I have driven past or worked through in the San Jose area and those that I have never heard of because I, they are all over the place. And I love that we are such an eclectic function here from all over the United States at this point. This is exciting. Excellent. And hello to Wisconsin. I'm here in Illinois actually today. So I'm feeling your, your Midwest vibes here. All right. Um, Brian, how do we look on our attendees and all right, excellent. We're going to go ahead and get started this afternoon. Um, I am so excited to have another year of this wonderful um, event. So welcome to our second summer series of the Teaching Academy. Just a couple of announcements of announcements before we get started. Um, a recording of this event will be available um, on the Academy's website after um, the presentation today. Um, if you uh, are interested in captions, you can hit the live transcript button to have uh, closed captioning available on this live broadcast, but then there will also be uh, captions on the recording. Um, remember that this is a webinar, so your microphone and your video are automatically turned off, um, but please feel free to use the chat to communicate with um, another or with one another and our presenters as well. And then just a quick little plug for our Facebook group and our LinkedIn group. Um, I know Brian's going to pop the links right there in the chat. Um, please join us, you know, keep on top of all the amazing things that Blurry College, Blurry College of Education offers here at San Jose State. Um, and it is a lot. So we would love to have you join our groups. Um, I'm going to take a quick moment and turn it over to our Dean at the College of Education, uh, Dean Heather Latimer, and she is going to welcome you into our exciting presentation today. Great. Well, thank you, Becca, and thank you to Marissa for presenting today and to Brian for all of your help behind the scenes. And thank you to all of you. I know that it has been a very long school year. And as you look ahead to next year, thinking about how we come back and how we come back with a focus on equity and justice and relationships and community is critically important to ensuring the success of our students. And in our college, we believe that our, our mission is to prepare transformative educators, counselors, therapists, school and community leaders in partnership with community. And last year, we launched this series recognizing that, oh my goodness, everybody was going to have to be online. And we hadn't prepared our teachers in the the many years that we've been doing this work to uh, be fully online teachers. That wasn't just part of the preparation. So we started really for our own teachers and our own community that were coming out of our college, but it quickly grew to be something that was a resource for the larger community in San Jose, as well as across the state and nationally. And so we've uh, the webinars that we've created last year have been viewed almost 25,000 times and were a real resource. And as we thought about this year and how we wanted to come back this year, we were thinking, you know, we don't, we don't want to focus again on teaching online. I think everybody at this point uh, uh, feels that we're ready to get out of our Zoom boxes, but we do need to think about coming back differently. We can't just come back to what was quote unquote normal because normal didn't work for too many of our children, too many of our communities, uh, uh, too many of our families. And so how do we think about coming back with the lessons learned from this year and, and centering those relationships and centering our students who perhaps previously had been marginalized and hadn't always been as successful as we, as we want them to be, as they want to be. And so that's the, at the heart of this series. And we are really thrilled to have some amazing presenters sharing their expertise. And again, deeply grateful to all of you for engaging in this larger community. So with that, I will pass it back to Becca to introduce today's speaker. All right, excellent. Yes, today's speaker, uh, the name of our, or the title of our, uh, or her presentation is the Discussion-Based Classroom. And today we welcome Marissa Thompson. She's an educator, a coach, and a speaker um, with the Carlsbad Unified School District. So without further ado, I know you will enjoy her as much as I have. Um, welcome, 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 Marissa. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Happy summer. 
happy Monday, happy Monday of our summer. I see there are a bunch of names from people from all over. Um, I'm thrilled to chat with you today. Uh, I also see that there are a bunch of people that are going to be teachers. Bless you, especially after everything that we've been doing this year and you've been hearing this year. It really um, is the just the most amazing profession. And um, I love that you're already seeking out professional development because it's only going to make your day to day better. It's going to make things better for your students. It's going to make your teaching experience better. So I'm thrilled to, to see that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I have to tell you, I am used to meet. And so, you know, you guys will need to tell me if we're struggling here. Let me help you. I already am. Where? There it is. Hi there. Can you give me a thumbs up? Can you see my slides? Are we good? Beauty. Thank you so, so much. All right. I'm actually going to get rid of these little pictures here. And I know I can go to more. I was taught, taught that today. Come here. Where are you? I'm sharing the screen. That's good. There we go. More. And I want to see the chat just in case. Okay, cool. And I'm going to get rid of my own picture Woo! because, you know, you know how it is. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really hope that I offer you some things today that, that will either be solutions for you, solutions for your students, or both is always my main goal. Um, and if it isn't the exact right solution for you, I hope you get a couple sparks of inspiration to find the solution that is going to work for you. Sometimes it gets handed right to you and you're like, thank you, this is exactly what I've been looking for. And then other times uh, it's not, but you're like, oh wait, I could actually, if I tweak this, right? So if you've got something that you can use, great. Almost every single thing in here is linked um, so that you can go ahead and take it and enjoy it and use it however you see fit. So um, I do need to say from the little get go here that um, these slides are for you and for attendees uh, that are watching the, the recording, they are for use for you and your current and future students. Okay. All right. If you are on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook or not, and you just want to go to the blog, um, the information is linked there for you. And I see that Brian has already put the slides into the chat. Thank you, Brian. All right, ready? This is me. Oh, maybe it's not, it's not me. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this on. It makes it work better. Or at least that's what I've come to find out. Does it not work better when I turn it on? The son of a gun. How about now? All right, this is me. My name is Marissa Thompson. Um, as you heard, I am a teacher. I'm an English teacher. I've been teaching for 15 years. I've also become the innovation coach for my district. Um, and I'm moving schools, which is a big deal for me. I've been in the same room for a long time. And you'll see my classroom in a minute. You'll see why it's, it's especially tough for me uh, to be leaving that room. Um, but I've taught everything that we offer, everything from our multilingual students, um, language arts support, college prep, honors, AP. Um, this year I'm going into the world of multimedia journalism, uh, which I admittedly don't know much about, but I'm excited about it because of all the voice and choice and creativity um, that inherently comes with it. I've been teaching since 2006. I am very much a lover of all things education and learning and teaching, like actual pedagogy. I love talking pedagogy. Um, I also do some professional development courses for the University of San Diego. My other life's passion besides my family is to travel. Um, my mom worked for the airlines, so I've been all over the place. I've taken students as well. And I've been really transforming the, the way that I teach for the last probably eight years or so, eight or nine years. And so I want to tell you a little bit about that journey because I think it'll serve as a, as kind of a foundation for everything else that we're going to be talking about today. I always start my presentations with a question. Sometimes if it's writing focus, we talk about writing. Do you remember your own writing struggles? If it's reading focus, you know, did you actually ever read those books that you were assigned? I only read one in high school, just saying. But in this case, I think the ultimate question is, what's your ultimate goal for your students? Like the ultimate, ultimate goal. Not the reading standard or the writing standard. Your ultimate goal 
And I know sometimes we say like, okay, your why, right? But this is a fun question. And, and when I do this in person, which I miss doing, I miss having the presentations in person, I get a lot of really cool answers. And I know we have the chat here. So if you don't mind, if you have your ultimate goal, if you know it off the top of your head, or if you have this kind of semblance of one, if you could throw it into the chat, that would actually be really nice. Do you do the waterfall thing where everyone types in, you hit enter and I'll, whoosh. that's a good one. The waterfall chat thing. No one has an ultimate goal for their students. It's really sad actually as educators. There we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, I love learning. Curiosity, right? Inquiry. Critical thinkers. Yes, thank you. Oh, they're, they're academically and as a, as a person to be good people, to feel confident. Oh my gosh, people, we're like best friends here. We should all work together. Yeah, to take control of their own life. Yes, thank you so much. To engage in their world thoughtfully. Oh, yes become better at learning, use strategies, set goals for themselves, meaningful goals, right? Be comfortable, join in our society and be critical, work in solidarity. I love, okay, you can keep entering it. It's wonderful. It's wonderful stuff. And it's so inspiring. It makes me feel ready to go back. I actually turned down my ultimate like dream job, I suppose, um, just a couple of weeks ago because I need my teacher spirit back. I need my teacher soul back. And I, I just desperately been wanting to get back into the classroom. My ultimate goal is you know, we're all together on this, right? Like I want students to feel confident in their own ideas and their own worth and their own soul and be willing and ready to communicate out all the good that they have in them while considering why they think what they think or why someone else thinks what they think. I want them to respect themselves and each other, the world. I want, to, I want them to make the most out of their life and out of their experience now, because this is real life instead of, you know, when in real life. I want them to give out their gifts that they have. I want them to live life very fully, fullest potential. Thank you, Angela. Yes. Okay. So I wasn't doing that. I know we talk about the why and I can say things like that. And there are other phrases too, things like have the students do the work. You shouldn't do the work. The students should do the work. You're doing the thinking, make the students doing the thinking. And it's like, okay, I like these phrases. I like these phrases a lot right? And I get that those are our whys. And especially, hey, Stephanie, um, I, I love that we want them to be inspired and curious and, and interact with the world. And I wasn't doing that as a teacher. I wasn't pushing that as a teacher. And so it's, yes, I know what my why is, but for me, it became so much about pedagogy. It became about, okay, but how am I supposed to do that? I promise you my kids are working. <laughs> like you should see all the assignments I have for them. I promise you that I, they're doing their thinking. I'm, I'm pushing them to do all these things. And so then as I started to make these changes, I realized for me, it's especially over the last year and a half, three teachers that I work with and collaborate with and absolutely love gems of the teaching profession have left in the last year. And I don't blame them. And when I, in my head, I tried to argue a little bit because they're so good, right? And they need to be in the classroom. And I'm in my head going, but it'll go back. It'll go back. It'll like, we'll go back into the classroom. It won't be like this, but they were already ready to leave before this. They had poured themselves out so much. And so as I'm watching that happen to these uh, incredible teachers, and also watching my students before COVID be kind of weighed down, I teach high school, be weighed down by the amount of work and pressure and grades and expectations and competition. And for me, I realized 
why am why do I want to teach? What do I want to teach? How do I want to teach it? And when do I want to teach it? When do I want them to be doing this work? Because I need whatever it is that we're doing to be sustainable for the student so that they're not exhausted. They remain inspired and curious and engaged with their, their own goals and materials and skills and each other. And I need it too. We were exhausted before COVID. We're definitely coming out of it. I hope, I hope you're sleeping a lot, a lot, a lot. But whatever it is that we do, when we talk about the why and the how and what and when, to me, my new thing is it's got to be good for students and teachers. We've got to be able to do things and keep the expectations high while also adjusting them so that we can keep our energy so that they can keep their energy at a high enough level to sustain that curiosity and that inspiration not just for the first few weeks or that one time that we do that cool project. So as you can imagine, that's not what I was doing. And I was quitting. After seven years of teaching, I actually had applications out. I was going to go be a corporate trainer, which is extremely inspirational. But I was out. And I realized that so much of that was because all I was doing was stuff more assignments, more quizzes, more tests, more essays. This is this was the bulk of my teaching. This is what I did. This is what my students did. There's not a ton of inspiration there. And there's definitely not a, a lot of curiosity there either. And I was exhausted because I was constantly creating and assigning and then you got to collect it and then you have to go over it and why didn't you do it? And okay, well, now I have a zero. Now I got to email, okay. But then now I got to take in those zeros back. We've got to do it, score it, give feedback. Weeks later, especially for a high school essay, it wasn't effective for me. It definitely wasn't efficient for me. And I don't think it was super effective or efficient for my students either. And so I was quitting. I chose to stay. It's a long story. I chose to stay and I went to a PD. We started unpacking the standards. I don't know why we always are constantly unpacking the standards or at least the work I was doing. We had a different chart every year where we had to put in the standards, unpack the standards. I think there's valuable work there. But I don't think the work that I was doing was necessarily valuable. But in the discussions about them, I realized the one thing that I needed to see was that the standards didn't mention homework, quizzes, or tests. Everything that I had been doing was how I was teaching those standards and none of those were required, except for the essays. They weren't required. So then it was kind of this freedom giving thing where I was like, well, if I don't have to do it that way, how could I do it? And it started me on the process that finally led me to be skills-based or standards-based or points-less or grade-less, whatever you want to call it, because I realized they don't need my points. They think they need my points. They need my help. Here's the skill I need them to master. Here's why I need them to master it. Here's how I'll help them in college and career and life and be meaningful to them. They just need my help. My superintendent a couple years ago at the back to school kickoff put this slide up and I've used it ever since. I use it at the beginning, middle, end of the school year. Anytime a student goes, why are we doing this? Which by the way, is a gift of a question. Why are we doing this? Hang on. We bring up this slide for you. I throw this up there and I go, all right, would you agree? These are 10 skills, the ones of 2020. These are 10 skills that you'll need regardless of what kind of work you do, regardless of what kind of life you want to lead. They're universal skills. They're the most in-demand skills right now, according to the future jobs report. How's it going, my high school juniors? How are we doing with these 10? And you watch them kind of look at it for a little bit and they're going, 
I don't even know what some of these mean. I know. Someone always says, oh, complex problem solving. I'm in algebra two. And I'm like, yeah, that's not exactly what they mean. But I put these up there so that whenever I'm trying to put together a skill building thing, or whenever a student asks for permission to do something, I use these as my excuse to say yes. Can we work together on this? I used to say no, because I have to grade it. Now I say yes, because it takes care of so many of these in-demand skills that I want them to practice. Anyway, when I looked at this list, I was like, yes, that's what I wanna do. Again, how do I do it? And where am I gonna find time? But since I stopped doing all of the things, all of a sudden I had a lot more time to do the real stuff. This is a long time ago, even when you would like pass the paper and you would have the kids grade it and everything, right? Pass with a partner, CB, write your name. I was grading stuff. My categories for grades were item specific. And when I started looking at my goals for my students over here on the left, these are the ones that are specific to my subject right? I need to teach these things. But it's the how that I really want them to practice. I want them to learn how to do these ELA specific things. It is my job. I have to do that. But I want them to do it in such a way that they're practicing listening and speaking and collaboration because I want them to be able to go and use their creativity and inspiration and be able to use technology, whether it's Google Meet or Zoom or whatever, I want them to be able to adjust and shift and feel comfortable and confident that they can figure things out. I think figuring things out is the ultimate gift I can give them is the ability to practice figuring it out and getting over their frustration when things aren't going their way. So I started changing things. I was like, all right, normally at the end of a novel, there's a unit test and then an essay and then we watch a movie. But I wanted the kids to start speaking more. So I did this kind of choose your own assessment. We're going to do two of each of these for, you know, the semester. And then so by the end of the year, you will have spoken four times, done, you know, timed essays, all these tests, whatever. It, and I was getting there, but I realized then that my classroom wasn't super conducive to the type of collaboration that I really wanted to do. And so inspired by the whole, you don't have to do homework quizzes and tests. And there's other ways to do things. Instead of doing a research paper, an individual research paper, and I hate to be like my students knowingly, we're just doing the same research topic that they did from two years before and the year before that or whatever. Instead of doing that, I said, hey, what if we apply for this grant? It's $20,000. We'll get there's two junior classes, there's 80 kids, because I had 41 in each class. There's 80 students. What if we all did the research and applied for a grant and totally transformed the classroom into like a modern environment where, where we could actually do stuff and create stuff? And like, and so we started looking at things like the Google campus and Qualcomm, Think of It Labs, and all these, like, look at these classrooms. So we did, we wrote this grant, we went on, you know, field trips, the whole thing, right? It was awesome. They worked really hard, it was definitely student run. I helped, it was my first time applying for a grant. We ended up writing like 16 pages, it was, I guess it was supposed to be two, um, but it was a research-based grant app, right? $20,000, you wanna see it? We didn't win, we totally lost, but, the coolest thing about losing was figuring out that we had to figure it out ourselves. I could have stopped there and be like, eh, we lost. But how cool that my students would start to walk into a place where I said, I had an idea, let's work together, let's make it happen. Oops, we lost, let's do it anyway. Hey, thank you. I have to say, it didn't cost nearly as much as you might think. A restaurant went out of business. I bought all the furniture for $225.
It's money. It's definitely money. It's a lot of money. It's $225. But I was there as much as I was at home. The TVs are from Craigslist. I got a whole thing about how you can do that. Okay. But you can also sign, you know, click that sucker and you can stand it. There's a 360 picture. My, my desk is gone. The whole thing. You can do things, but I liked showing my students. You can do things. It's not necessarily going to be handed to you. But now that I had this environment where kids could do things, it started to change everything for me. I go, okay, well, wait, I can't do it the way that I used to because they're all sitting right next to each other. I can't do quizzes and tests in the same way. I don't know how I'm going to do this, right? So it started to change things. Over the last year, I realized what I really needed during this time of COVID, and really, I guess, what I've always needed are the exact same things that my students need. I need people to be clear with me about what they need and what I'm supposed to do. So do my students. I need time to make it happen. Just give me some time. I will make it happen. I will do a good job. My students do too, if I give them the time in class. I need the flexibility to do it my way because if I try and mimic what you're doing exactly the way that you're doing it, it may not turn out as well as I can probably do it if I did it my way. Same for my kids, especially when all the meetings started with COVID and board meetings were tough at times. And I just needed to feel like I was respected as a professional. And there were a lot of things said over the last year and a half that were really rough, you know? My students want that same respect. Everyone does. I need to feel like whatever I'm doing has a purpose that is meaningful, that there's a reason why I'm working all the time on it. My students need to know that information too. I need a little bit of control. The last year and a half, everything has been out of my control and I didn't like it. And looking back before COVID, before I started changing some things, my students had little to no control of whatever we were doing or learning or what they were writing about, especially what they were reading. Anyway, I noticed that I could start changing things, right? So instead of the things, I could get the same information and I could offer better practice of the skills by making everything discussion. My students write, but we talk a lot first. I don't do quizzes. I don't do tests. They don't have homework besides reading. Everything is done 100% in class where they can get support, They can have time to work. They can put their headphones in, sit on the floor, work away. Everything for us is discussion-based. Instead of creating and assigning and collecting and all these things, I actually use discussion as my formative and often summative grading. It's discussion-based. Now, when we talk about equity and everything, I'm gonna come to that towards the end of the presentation because My students with 504s and IEPs and my multilingual students so appreciated this, this shift, because it decreased the quantity focused on what they knew and understood and could do instead of how much they could do or complete. It was skill-based. And so I realized I could have them learn all the things that I wanted them to learn. If I let them practice, I gave them the tools and I gave them encouragement. So very rarely was I actually complimenting my students, which I am ashamed to admit. When you talk about though, that I've got 40 students in a classroom, you know, changing every two hours or for some people every hour, it's really difficult to provide information right? Provide the tools, explain things, get them started, check on them, and then be able to see what they're working on and compliment them, all of them. Discussions allowed me to start doing that, which is great. And when I started thinking about this presentation and especially what we're coming out of and what we're going back to, the one thing that I'm missing are the discussions I was talking with my my own kids. I have a a, a kid who's going to be eight and a son who's going to be six. So my daughter and my son are sitting here, they're watching TV. 
I come out. Hey guys, would you like a pancake or are you having Cheerios? No response. Okay. So first of all, okay. But pancake. Yeah. Pancake. They go like this. The mom and me took care of all of that, but the teacher and me reflected on the fact that for a year and a half, our students have been on mute. Literally the thing is called mute. They've been covering their face with masks. I'm a masker. It's fine. Like, but just the covering of the mouth, the button of mute, and then using hand signals to communicate. They've been out of practice talking to people. I know that maybe, maybe that sounds too extreme, but I really have been thinking about it. And at a time when in the last year, there has been a lot to talk about. And if there's anything that's true, we've really realized how much more our society needs to be better at discussion. There's a lot to process, not just in the changes in education, but just as a person. I attended a, a presentation a couple of weeks ago and they had us reflect for two minutes uh, on three different topics. One was, what did you realize about teaching? What did you realize about your colleagues and administrators? Or yeah, what did you realize about teaching and your students? Another two minutes for what did you realize about your colleagues and administrators? What did you realize about your family and yourself? And there were things that came out of just those couple minutes of reflection for me where I, it, it really put me back. And I realized my students are going to need to reflect as well. We need to talk about this. We can't just go in, go back and be like, hey, let's do our warm-up activity. Like it's, we probably need to have a discussion about what just happened. There's a link here to, it's a um, 2020 in pictures from the New York Times. Amazing, Real, small blurbs for each one could be a, a real discussion starter. Anyway, that's where I am. Here are some of the activities that I do. And I know that I won't be able to get to all of them, but they are linked. Some of them will go to a blog. You'll be able to see them. First things first, the students are going to probably be a little bit uncomfortable speaking again. And really before this, my students were already having trouble with the, dis the difference between discussion or debate. And so there were things that I would do in order to get them to talk to each other, especially the freshmen, right? They come in, they don't say a word. They sit with somebody, hopefully that they know, otherwise they don't say a word. I started doing group graffiti and it was fun. I bring out a big old sheet of, of paper. Everyone gets a different colored marker. They have the sheet. I put up random questions, best ride at Disneyland, where to get the best breakfast burrito, right? Just what kind of ice is better for soda, whatever. And then every time there's a new question, they turn the paper, they doodle. By the time that they get to their fifth or sixth questions, they're all just talking to each other. That's the goal. I don't, I mean, I use this to decorate the classroom, but the goal is just to get them talking. I bring them in again and we do, sorry, I didn't realize I was gonna play audio. It's 10 seconds, hang on, listen. I just want them talking to each other. So for 11 sheets of paper, you've got 15 minutes, 11 sheets of paper and three other really smart people with you. Make a tower as tall as you can, no tape, no nothing, just paper, go. And they're all, whoa, no instructions, nothing. 15 minutes, make it happen. The tallest one was just under five feet, like half an inch under five feet. There are some really interesting conversations that come from that. We do have a discussion about it and I'm like, okay, what did you try, right? what went well, what didn't go well, will you be able to apply what you just learned from today? And they're saying, they're like, are you kidding me, a paper tower? And it's like, no, it's about talking to each other. Okay, it's about talking to each other. Apply what you learned. Did you do a good job as a team or not? And they say, okay, yeah, okay. And we talk about it a little bit. I say, okay, are you gonna be able to work as a team in the future? And they're like, oh yeah, okay, okay, fine. They come in the next day, I put this up on the screen. I have a bucket and I'm going like this. 
It's got a whole bunch of puzzle pieces. At this point, they realize I'm not, you know, <laughs> giving them like bell work or something, right? So they sit there and go like, okay, usually one of the questions is, is this for points? And I just sit there, you know, no. The teams work, they make these collections of puzzles. There's actually five different puzzles in here, totally worth my five bucks at the dollar store, right? Each one is like 24 pieces. It's not a big deal. Some groups, and you're talking juniors in high school, have taken close to 20 minutes to make it happen. Like it's, it's the weirdest thing to watch this happen and watch them really fail. Other groups take it. They've got somebody communicating, standing up, manager of the team, you two there, what color? Oh, we have balloons, jelly beans over here. Oh, wait, there's a horse. Anybody have a horse over here? Like, it's interesting to watch who can communicate well, who doesn't, who sits back and lets other people handle it, who all of those things are worth talking about. And then we move to actual discussion topics, but again, no risk, right? After we do this, I said, look, you said last time you were going to apply that information. So let's go to this. We start going to these topics that really don't matter because we're not going to have cake. We're not going to have pie, but it lets them practice how to talk to one another, especially when they disagree, right? So they stand up, they line up, they jotted down their three different reasons for one or the other. And they end up doing cake, boo, cake, pie, pie is better, pie's not better. Like it's, it's exactly what you might think it would be. And so I said, okay, now hang on. How'd that go as far as a discussion? And we talk about the difference between a discussion and a debate. And we start using response stems. Like I hear what you're saying about the beach and how there's waves. And so there's more that you can do with that versus the pool. But the pool doesn't have the sand, you know, and the seagulls and everything else that like, you know, like that's a really good point about the pool. I actually, I hadn't thought really about the seagulls and how they, you know, eat all the food and everything. But the other thing I wanted to say about the beat, all of a sudden it changes, right? We practice, we practice. And I tell them, look, you can learn a life lesson from anywhere. Now we're going to practice with literature. We're going to practice with all sorts of things. And I know you have ideas. But you can't just tell people your idea, whether it's spoken or written, you have to be able to explain it. And you have to be able to explain in a way that people will want to understand. And I tell them that's the same thing with your writing. You have all of these great ideas in your head. You have a bunch of great ideas, I know you do. But we have to pull them out a little bit and make them happen in such a way that somebody who takes your opinion, your paper, and reads it, it makes sense to them that they are willing to take that information in. So we'll work on that. Anyway, we practice discussion. We do the same thing when it comes to reading and writing. This is essay brackets. It is actually the coolest activity. It'll take a day or two, depending on um, how long your class periods are. But talk about purposeful discussion. Talk about not having to explain to students why it's so important to go through the essay, the full writing process, they argue, they argue about it. It's so fun not to be able to say, look, a topic sentence is really important. Topic sentence is really important. Or a conclusion is really important when you're trying to make your point. They get to argue about it. They're practicing, here's my opinion here's my reasoning why, right? Here's my evidence. Let me explain it to you. That's a fun activity. I also stop doing a lot of individual work. Again, if we're collaborating, we get those right ideas. It steers people back if they've got the wrong idea. Um, and it allows for faster practice. It also allows for me to go around and compliment, encourage, or uh, provide some critical feedback. Instead of journals, I started doing what I call board meetings, okay? Um, and you can have the board meetings as well. I, we made these rolling whiteboards, these double-sided whiteboards, and I absolutely love using them. We get to the point where instead of 20 minutes as a class to create an outline based on a random topic or question, they get down from group to partners to individuals, and they end up planning an essay in, I, th I think we get under seven minutes, invaluable for them as they move through school, as they move through college. 
Anyway, fun activity to start with. If you want that information, I have those there for you as well, as well as uh, the information about those board meetings. All right, when it comes to the difference between evidence and analysis, it's very difficult for my students to understand the difference, which baffles me, but it remains true, right? And so my job is not to sit there and go, I just don't understand how you don't get this. My job is to help them understand, right? So I love using art for that. There are so many great things that come from putting up a piece of art that the students have not seen and say, all right, what do you see? And for a lot of students, it's the first time that they've really thought about the fact that an artist might be portraying an opinion that the choices were made with purpose, that this came, yes, that this came as a blank canvas and now is trying to communicate a message. And I tell them it's the same thing with books. Sure, the author wants to write a book and sell it. They would like to make money off of it. They're writers, they would, it's their profession, but they're trying to communicate something to you through story. I always use George and Lenny as an example, right? Of Mice and Men. George didn't kill Lenny. John Steinbeck had George kill Lenny. Why? He didn't have to. It's a blank page. He made him do that. He made him say that. He had Slim come and meet George afterwards. He ended with that question from Carl. Like, it was on purpose. Why do you think they did that? This is one of our first writing activities is on Rockwell. It's great stuff. Super fun. As you saw with my classroom, I did change things. I got nervous when we went to one-to-one, -one, which is so funny, right? But I got nervous when we went to one-to-one -one a couple of years ago because I was afraid that students would stop talking to each other, which I guess technically did seem to happen. I didn't want them focusing just on their screen. I was nervous that if I did that, that it would all become just essays and tests and quizzes again, but just computer-based. And I wanted to increase the discussion and creativity. TVs helped me do that. I actually bought two yes, I bought two TVs yesterday for 30 bucks in my neighborhood. So I can donate them to other teachers. The biggest thing that I do when it comes to reading and writing and discussion is TQE. TQE is thoughts, questions, and epiphanies. It's something that I made up. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to become a thing. It's now being used around the world, classrooms from kindergarten up through grad school. It's really simplistic but it's meaningful. It allows students to go with their own curiosity, with their own discoveries. They get to determine what we're doing, what we're talking about every time that they read something. They take down their own information, their own thinking. They come together into small groups. They curate that thinking. They offer the class a couple topics for us to discuss. That's what we do. I'm not creating, I'm not making quizzes, I'm not making copies, I'm not passing things out, I'm not pushing things out through Google Classroom. You're gonna read it, you're gonna tell me what you think, we'll have a discussion about it. And it becomes little mini writing lessons as well. But I can assess which students read, which students understand it, how well they understand it, can they analyze what the author is doing, can they figure out the theme. I don't need to create, they don't need to complete, I don't need to enter zeros or scores. This is what I do for reading and writing every day. There are other activities as well that I provided for you here. I realize I'm running a little low on time. So again, it's about practicing it. And so many of my students can practice it out loud so much faster and with more clarity than they can on paper. And I can provide that feedback. Vandy, I, I actually have that information for you in that link there and i'd be happy to talk to you about it we are going to have a q a after it i'm telling you it's 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 everything for us that's that's the ultimate foundation of our class okay um since then right since doing that and having those conversations i really wanted students to be able to create things based on their thinking not just essays i wanted them to go through the practice of having an idea and have that like great idea they very rarely in my class used to have ideas because I never asked them to have one. And then there were always, when I did ask them, there were always these little things that would kind of shrink that idea down. But I wanted to get their gears turning. I wanted them to figure things out so that then there could be this balance of what they originally thought and what was possible. When I look at the skills that I used to 
teach. They keep upping, you know, for a while it was first, you're going to analyze then you're going to synthesize. No, wait, the best one you can do is evaluate. No, wait, the best thing you can do is create. And I don't disagree necessarily. I just think once we analyze the information or synthesize it or evaluate how good it was or how well the author did, and we create something, there has to be the communication of this is what I read. This is what I thought. This is what I decided to do. This is why I made it this way. This was my process. This is my hope for it. It's about the communication. They're going to need that no matter what they do. They're going to need it for business proposals. They're going to need it for pitches. They're going to need it for anything. And so it's not necessarily, I want you to learn how to embed quotes, or I want you to learn how to use Google Suite. It's that I want you to learn how to learn. I want you to learn how to learn how to do stuff. I want you to learn how to learn how. So that when you get to a new tool or a, a new reading or a new course that you can go through that and figure out what to do and how to do it. You can do it. And again, that flexibility, right? You can do it your way. So instead of now brainstorming, I show students, instead of just showing them my stuff, I show them the ideas that other students have used when they brainstorm for, for writing. Do whatever works for you. Do whatever works for your brain. We read Antigone, a couple thousand years old Greek play. And I said, should we continue reading Antigone? It only takes a few days. It's not a big deal, but is there relevance in it? If you haven't read Antigone, there's a ton of relevance in it. So I had my students have a Socratic seminar and knowing that some of my students wouldn't feel super comfortable, especially Antigone is the first thing we read. I had them have a co-pilot and there was a shared slide deck for the entire class. And I had one person in the center, one person on the out, and they could communicate on their slide, share ideas, share encouragement. It's a nice way to track things as well in case you need to go back and start assessing their understanding. From that discussion, students pulled a relevant theme that would make sense to a modern audience and that they wanted to communicate something that they learned from Antigone and the discussion and that they wanted to say out to the world. So in one class period, they created a PSA poster. I had them printed at the district office, totally cool, framed them, put them in the hallway. My students got really frustrated with me. It was the first time that I gave them verbal feedback, right? Have the discussion about feedback. And I said, look, this is gonna be my first time. We're getting to know each other. I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm gonna be honest. It may not feel super good, but I'm gonna be honest with you because I want you to make the best products you possibly can. And so often, especially this is my honors class, they raise their hand, we're done. And you know, the teacher side of you is like, oh yeah, okay. So, yay, I'm so glad. So I go to the table and these, these sweet girls, they just graduated. No, they're sophomores in college now. And they're looking at me and they're like, we are done. And I was like, okay, I don't get it. And they're sitting there going, you should see them all looking at each other, right? And I go, I don't, I don't understand. So the way I read this, right? And I go into it and I'm like, okay, but why did you choose that color green? Is there a reason, what does this guy mean? What is this? They're, they're all going, okay. They did another one. They're like, okay, okay, we'll, we'll work on it. They do another one. I come back. Okay. So why that green then? Because I don't, is it supposed to feel, it was like a neon bright green. They're like, I don't know. We just liked it. I'm like, okay, but you know, think back to Rockwell, you're communicating something right now. It's communicating like Key West. I don't, I, I don't know what, I don't understand. So again, and they're getting frustrated. We get to the point afterwards, and they're not happy. They're not happy with me. I mean, like not happy with me. A couple of days later, one of the girls, she comes to my class and I was like, hey, wrong day. We're in a block schedule, wrong day. You're not in here and you should see her face. She's got this paper. And I said, you okay? And she goes, 
I get what you're doing now. I said, okay. She shows me this thing. She's like, I have this project I have to do for another class. And it's pages and pages of instructions. And I was like, all right. She goes, I went to the teacher and said, I had an idea that I wanted to do. And he said, I couldn't do it. And he said, those are my instructions. And I said, okay. She's like, I, I get what you're doing with not doing instructions. Cause she was really frustrated. She said, instructions are limitations. And I was like, yes. And I love it. I'm sorry. And I'm going to put it in every single uh, presentation I do and tell that story. My students have done similar projects for us versus hate, which is a great thing. They've made these. This particular poster over here on the left is made up of like 10 different images, but it looks great, doesn't it? And so full of thought, if you were to actually have your students analyze some of these, they were fun. I do like using computer-based programs for it. We use Canva. I like using Canva for it because I can offer feedback and they can make adjustments. We can have those discussions instead of you make the thing for a week, I collect it, I give it a grade. We can build on the discussion, we can build on the skill, we can build that trust, they can make a product they're proud of. When I'd done projects before in the past, I'm sure these are amazing, right? They're gorgeous, look at that, they're gorgeous. I'm not really gonna, what kind of feedback am I gonna offer on like, what of this thing on the left, what am I supposed to say besides like, wow, that's really pretty. I couldn't make that. Like I, there's no discussion there. Anyway, I started to revamp things. So this was a look back on the year. When you look back at this year, what will you take with you? What will you think about? I don't actually know what the theme really is over here on the left. It's gorgeous, but I don't, the thing on the right makes a little bit more sense thematically to me. Anyway. When I started getting the chance to do that project, but with tech, I renewed that project and I started doing videos based on the Google's year in search. So fun, so good. The instructions are there for you. And I had my students do something similar where they left a word in the year before and they picked a word to guide them, a one word project, right? I'm not gonna play the video because I am running low on time, but you are welcome to watch it. Whoop, there we go, hang on, no. This is an individual one word project. And then I had a student say, can we work together as a group? Now, before I used to say, no, 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 no. Everyone needs to do their own project. But when I start looking at these skills again, one of my classes, made one project, the entire group, 40 students made a two minute video. It's gorgeous, you should totally watch it. They said, how about instead of, cause it was 2019, instead of looking back just at 2019, we wanna look back at the whole decade. The amount of collaboration and tech that needed to go into that, they had, they learned how to do spreadsheets. They learned how to do like conditional formatting and hyperlinking and this group is going to work on this year. No, wait, we should do it thematically because it wouldn't make sense unless we do Like if we're doing a message and okay, what message? And they choose the music and they decided not to speak their own words and who's going to find it. And it took a couple of weeks, but the product is fantastic. If you have time, click it, open it in a new, in a new window. But I started revamping everything. Beginning of the year, I would have students write this letter to me and it was such a non-me way to start a class, right? It would take an hour and a half. Some kids would fluff it off. It wasn't a big deal. Now they make a video of that I am from poem. And now that we added where I'm going as well and turned it into a video instead of just a poem. Things can be done and it doesn't have to be a massive shift. You just have to provide students the time to create. They're gonna get frustrated. That's great because then you can have that conversation and you can offer help or not, which is also great. Thank you, everyone's being so sweet. Thank you, everyone in the chat. Okay, now I also use discussion for grades and for feedback, okay? These used to be my grading categories. Do they look familiar? It's okay if they do, this is what I did, right? But for me now, it's not the stuff. 
it's the goal. So I choose four unique skills for a grading period. And the fifth is professionalism, organization, and clarity. Effort, but not necessarily effort. It depends on what is happening. But the four different skills, and I focus on those, and we practice those, and we practice those a million different ways with the board meetings and with videos or, you know, an activity in class or a discussion that we have about the book or TQE and it's up on the board. And I can sit there and go, Jason has it. He totally understands author's purpose. I don't have to collect a billion things and grade it and spend all that time. Jason has it. Milin has it. You're working on it. You know, you can. Anyway, these are my goal categories and this is my grade book. All right. You're welcome to it. Let me just explain it. Okay, so I have my skills here at the top. These are my skills, right? And then these are drop downs. They're color coded because I'm a visual person. And to me, if they're doing it, it's you're meeting the expectation. You're doing what I'm asking you to do. If they could like explain it to people and help somebody else and and all those, then you're exceeding. You're excelling. I want it to say excel. I haven't changed it yet. If you're not quite there or it's somewhat inconsistent, it's approaching, right? Or needs support. All right, here's what it's gonna look like, okay? This is what it's gonna look like. Don't freak out. Okay, so let's say here's Samantha. Samantha has, to me, meeting grade level is a B. She has two Bs, three As. You put those together, it's an A minus. That's me grading. Not zeros, not percents, not a kid coming up going, I need four more points in order to get it. I'm not, uh uh, right? And then I have my notes here. So when a kid goes, How come I have a grade that I do? Well, bud, when it comes to analysis, like literary terms, yeah, you ace it, you did a great job. But when it comes to analysis and author's purpose, I haven't seen it. I, I, you may know how to do it. I don't see it. I haven't seen it yet. For me, I need to see something three times to have it be that you can do something consistently at a particular level, to me, that's your grade. If you can do it three times, that's probably where you are, okay? Anyway, this has made my life outrageously easy and focused for the goals for my students. When they're writing an essay, I have discussions with them, all 40 in every day for one, two, three, like, like a week and a half. Uh, it's every other day. So like three classes, three classes, block schedule. I get three students or three minutes per student. Again, it can be explained. It's a whole presentation in itself, but I have a discussion for feedback. And in their Google doc in the comment, I use a text extender. I use pro keys. I went from like 150 to 200 hours of essay grading a year at home to zero hours of essay grading at home, zero hours. And the writing improved exponentially. And the stress regarding essays decreased like crazy, as did the students who were avoiding the essay, they stopped avoiding them. It was kind of a cure-all, be happy to give that to you. I realize now the link's not on there. I genuinely apologize, we'll figure it out. If you're sticking around in the chat, we'll make sure that you have that, I'm sorry about that. When I meet with them, I say, okay, here are the four skills, right? And then, so everything that kind of goes in there that used to be this massive rubric of all these different things, I meet with them and I look, so far you're at like a six. But if you fix this one thing over here, like your introduction really needs work, they go, they work on it, they improve it. I keep track here. It also helps them focus, right? So, hey, Nick, right now, this stuff, it's amazing. I actually need you to go help him. Okay. And then this one, super, super good. But right now your evidence doesn't really match and you're not embedding it properly. So you need to kind of go and that's what you need to work on. Don't worry about these other things. Work on that. It's encouraging. It's focusing. It's helpful as opposed to what I used to do. It's inspired by a single point rubric. Okay. Um, and this is the link to cult of pedagogy single point rubric. Again, I'm providing the practice in class. I provide them the tools in the text extender. I'm like, you can do it. Look, you did these two things. These are so much harder. Go work on this one. Your link is there that you can, you can use, okay? It'll show you how to do it. Go do that. It's useful. 
even my back to school night is student discussion based. I only have a couple more slides and I promise to be done and, and move into a Q&A. I do a student led back to school night because my student, it took a while to convince my students by the end of the year, they definitely converted to my educational philosophy, which is great. But every year it's a little tough to explain it to the students and to the parents. So back to school night, sorry, the sprinklers just came on and it's actually coming in my house. Back to school night is led by the students themselves. So my last year students, I offer them volunteer hours. They come and talk and they have different stations and we do a station back to school night, but it's student led. One of the stations is you meet me. It's awesome. It's student led. It's everything, right? It's everything. It's so fun. Okay. What else? Oh yeah. Equity. When it comes to students who are ill or who have things going on in their family or like this last year, right? How much flexibility we realize we really need to have probably all the time, as well as my students who have learning disabilities, they've got 504s, IEPs for a reason. And my multilingual students who are like, oh, it takes me forever to write it, but I could explain it to you. I assess their skills. I don't assess the stuff I do for the essays, but I'm still, when I look at the essay, I'm looking at the skill. When it comes to these things that I need, I want to offer that to my students. And I recognize that not all of my students are going to want to talk. And so just like for my student who I said, look, when it comes to this skill, I haven't seen it. When it comes to that, I go, all your stuff is your insurance. So if that student went and said, okay, well, wait, I've got all my stuff. I got all my stuff here. I'll get all my stuff. They go, they get their stuff. I can see their analysis on their work. Great. Show me, show me your stuff. Same thing here. If a student isn't talking a lot, I can still see all their notes from that Socratic seminar. I can have them practice lots of things. Their grade isn't determined by one essay at a time when they, you know, things were going on or it was the championship, whatever. They wrote for six weeks. We practiced a ton of skills. They plugged in evidence of their different skills. That's a fun thing too. They wrote a ton. I collected this to assess their skills. It's different. It's a shift. They're still working a lot. High expectations. They're meeting them, exceeding them but in a way that's efficient and effective for everybody and low stress. Same thing with templates. Templates are the best thing in the world. You can use this for any grade level. You can use it for any text. Some of my students started doing left and right annotations for their other classes as well. It's everything I need from them. I need all the information coming from the text. I need all the information about their thinking and I need you to put it into a thesis really, or a theme doesn't look like left and right annotations are on there either, the link to them, but I'll make sure that you have that as well. I made templates as well for outlining an essay. Same thing for outlining a presentation, same thing for outlining, I don't know, speech, same thing. But I want the students to be in control of what they're showing me as their evidence. I want them to be able to use whatever they're thinking. I haven't given an essay prompt in years. Whatever you're thinking is what I want to know about. Prove it to me. But I also want them to be able to lead the narrative at home. So this is an email that this past year students were sending home to me, an advisor, and their supporter at home. And it was so cool because it started email chains between the parent, the student, and me. And they were encouraging. So the parent would write back and go like, hey, way to go, Sarah. You're doing a great job. And I would, you know, reply to and go like, isn't Sarah the best? Sarah's the best. It's so community building. And it's the student leading the communication instead of teacher and parent discussing and having the student just sit there as a bystander, like, oh crap, here we go. Because that was my experience. If you haven't seen most likely to succeed, so good, so good. We started doing teacherless student-led conferences. I'm going to say it again, teacherless student-led conferences. We did all student conferences, all parent-teacher conferences in one night. I had 200 students. We did them all in three hours. But look at the communication. Look at this buddy here. Look at this guy. He is telling, just wait a second. I'm going to tell you something. Look, and he's telling, look, they're all looking at him. 
It's so good. What a great shift. Anyway, no matter what we do, we're going to have to try stuff. It doesn't mean throwing everything out. Oh, Cynthia, it's so cool. We'll have to talk about that one too. Try things. Reflect on it. Is this working for you? Is this sustainable? Is it sustainable for them? Is everyone just totally depleted? And if not, try something. Reflect. Did it work? Talk to them. My greatest collaborators are my students, for sure, because they're with me on it. And whatever it is that you come up with, apply it. Try it again. Apply it. Try it again. I have a video for you in case you want to pass it to somebody else. This is all my like main activities at the beginning of the year, six of them or so, um, in a video that takes about 15 minutes. So if that's useful to you, please go ahead, enjoy. My students have all given permission, of course. Anyway, I would love to chat with you. Sorry for going a little bit older. I, I know we started, um, or I started a few minutes after the hour, so I hope that that's okay with you. Uh, I know that we've got the slides there for you. I know I have a couple links I need to give to you. If you'd like to connect, if you need some PD for your school or your team, please let me know. I'd be happy to come play. Anyway, thank you so much, everyone. I know we're going into a discussion. Thank you so much. I hope it's useful. Take good care of yourselves. Take good care mm -hmm. of your students. Take good care of your families. I wish yes. you good things. Thank you so, so very much, Marissa. What a wonderful presentation. Um, and just so we can kind of transition a little bit quickly here, um, I know Brian did put in the link um, to the discussion room. Uh, just a couple of notes about the discussion room. The discussion room is a regular Zoom meeting, so everyone will have access to their microphone, and if you choose, access to your video as well, so those things will be back on versus the webinar. So if you um, would like to join us, we would love to keep talking with you, and um, thank you so much to Marissa for this amazing presentation. I think this just really provides such a valuable experience for all of our teachers, future teachers and administrators and faculty that are here today with us. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm gonna jump over.